We left off with how Satan attacks. He usually will attack your character, your influence, your calling, and your humility. Those four are the main areas. He will get one hook in one and then slowly work his way around those other three areas. <clears throat> so I just want to, I want you to, I, that's how we're going to build this thing into this session in leadership, okay? But Paul, understanding that, he masterfully answered that charge by turning it completely around on his critics. Uh, you know, I'm not that smart. I would have never thought of doing that. But he did. Look what he says. S turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Because you see, it's not if this is going to happen in your ministry. It's not if this is going to happen to your ministry. It's when it happens in your ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. He, he, um, let me... Um, couch this by saying this. Let me preface this. That <clears throat> Paul is speaking in a language. He's using phrases and words that his audience clearly understands exactly what he's saying because they spoke in those terms. Today, it is our responsibility from the pulpit to the pew to explain how the language is being used so that you would understand, your people are going to understand the same thing that Paul's original audience understood. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's, been, that's really important. So I want you to bear that in mind in this particular session and in the next few sessions, how we unpack this. We're going to be speaking in terms that our people today do not understand, but it is our responsibility to explain it. So I'm going to try to help you to do that. Paul masterfully answered the charge by turning around against his critics, and he said, who is adequate for these things? This is what he said, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Well, let me ask you a question. You read that verse, and you go, what? What is he talking about? To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? It's like, I don't know. I have no clue what he said there. Well, that's typically, that's the typical kind of reaction or, or response that you're going to get from a lot of people. <clears throat> you go, I, I, well, let me see. The last part of the verse that says, and who is adequate for these things, I understand that. But the first part, I don't get it. What does the first part have to do with the second part? What does the second part have to do with the first part? Well, let's see if we can get this straight. Remember, Paul is speaking to an audience that understands what he's saying. Which is the re and that was key because they were going to have to react. They were going to have to respond to Paul's counter charge because that's exactly what he's doing here against the false teachers, the false prophets. Okay? The false apostles that had that had come within the congregation and raised their ugly head. Remember their complaint was the false teachers that he was not adequate to lead. That was the complaint, right? Paul answers their complaint with a question at the end of a statement. And who is adequate for these things? So don't get lost in this. Just stay with me on this. Look at it. So let's begin and we see if we can get an understanding of what he's talking about here. In that very same context here, in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul compared the ministry of the gospel to a triumphal procession. That's what he's doing here. He's doing an analogy, a comparison, but something that his audience understood then. When a Roman general or Caesar won a key and decisive military victory, a formal triumphant would be held to honor him and commemorate the victory. 
The triumph was a massive celebratory parade, one of the most important and colorful pageants in the Roman culture. The victorious leader would be carried through the streets with his army marching behind and holding the captured spoils and other tokens of victory aloft. So they would be carrying all the spoils, the silver, gold, the jewels up. It'd be, it, 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 they would hold it aloft. They would hold it up so that, so, so that the throngs of people, the thousands and thousands of gathered, could clearly see what was happening here. And then the priests would accompany the parade, and they'd be have all these priests from the temples, okay? And they would be waving these censers of powerful incense. Now, if you were raised in the uh, Roman Catholic Church and you went to a Roman Mass, a Roman Catholic Mass, you would understand what I'm talking about. They would have these big censers, okay? Well, when during the parade, the, the, the priests, they would have these censers, okay? And they would create this aroma, this aroma, okay? And so they were, they'd be waving these censers of powerful incense, diffusing a sweet-smelling aroma through the whole city. Are you getting the picture here? Go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 2.16. To the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. Hang on. Stay with me. Now, when Titus Vespasian, he sacked Jerusalem in the year of A.D. 70, he was given a triumph. Okay? And now... In Rome, they had this ark, okay? And at the base of this ark, okay, they had these figures carved into this ark, okay? And, uh, and, and, the, and the figures of the ark of Titus in Rome portray that event. So when you come into Rome, you will see this big ark, and it would portray the, it would portray the victory of Titus Vespasian, okay, sacking Jerusalem. And, and that, so you'll see that, okay? In fact, uh, there, there are pictures of that still available today. <clears throat> Such celebrations were extremely rare, reserved only for the most critical victories, and it was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Now, what does that have to do with 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16? Everything. Because this was, the, this was the reference that Paul, this is how Paul chose, listen to this carefully now. This is how he chooses to respond to the false charges of his inadequacy to lead. This is brilliant. To the one in aroma from death to death in verse 16, to the other in aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Watch this. Now, but Paul said that the ministry of the gospel is like a perpetual triumph, that parade, right? He likened himself to a censor through Christ. He said that he was, you know, the censor? Okay, to the aroma, remember he says, to the one in aroma from death to death and to, uh, to the other in aroma from life to life. Remember the, the high priest with the censors? So Paul is liking himself as a censor, an incense, okay? Okay? Through whom Christ manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Now look at this. Just back up two verses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Are you seeing that now? Now you see what this analogy he's drawing it out of. You can see now with verse 16 how he responds to that. He's been building on this very slowly. And his audience has a clear understanding, a very clear picture of how he's responding to the false teachers, the false prophets, the false apostles. Now. Most Roman triumphs also featured a, a uh, they would have a procession of chained prisoners, okay? They, they would have these chained captives, right? And so they would be coming. And these would be enemy warriors who were condemned to die at the culmination of the procession. They were marching to their death. 
They would, this was a, a parade, a victory parade. But the chained prisoners, they were marching to their death. Because once the parade was over, they were going to die. Now, they would, of course, smell, they, of course, would smell the aroma of the fragrant incense. Why? Because the priests would be, have these senses, okay? And they understood what that meant. The smell of the aroma, okay? Uh, the smell of the aroma of the fragrant incense, but to them is signified defeat and death not victory and life. Now go back to verse 16. To the one an aroma from death to death, that was those who were in chains, they were the prisoners, the warriors, they were the enemies. When they smell that, they go, we're going to die. To others from life to life. It was the victorious soldiers and the victorious uh, empire. They can smell that. We've continued to be victorious from life to life. Do you, do you see the picture? Mm -hmm. Now, let's, we'll, we'll tie this together, and you'll be, it'll make more sense. And so now, this is what you have. Paul said the gospel incense. Now, go, now, go to verse 15. Verse 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Look at this. He said the gospel incense is the fragrance of Christ. Watch this. It, and he says that it's precisely like that. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Remember the parade? Okay? So you have two groups of people there. And you can clearly see this. They understand this. Now, it has a similar twofold meaning to those who believe, right? Right? Because that's go back to go back to um, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 2 15. For we are a fragrance of Christ, we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved. In other words, those who believe they're the ones who are being saved, it is an aroma of life. Then at the end of that verse, and among those who are perishing, it signifies death and condemnation. Do you see that? So Paul is painting a picture that the people would understand exactly where Paul is, and exactly where all these false apostles are. So then he wrote, <clears throat> let's go back to 2 Corinthians 2.16. Now, what was the charge? You remember the charge was that <clears throat> he was not adequate to lead. He was inadequate. Remember the charge? So now here's where Paul ties it all together. This is where he raised the question, and who is adequate for these things at the end of verse 16? To the one in the Roman from death, and to the other in the Roman from life, and who is adequate for these things? Well, who is adequate to partake in Christ's triumphal parade and to be an instrument through which the incense of the gospel message is diffused to all? Now are you getting the picture? Who in himself is qualified to receive accolades from Almighty God for service rendered to him on behalf of Jesus Christ? Who? Who is qualified? He was turning the tables on the false teachers. That's what he was doing. Calling into question their claim that they were adequate. He said, in fact, that they were guilty. Look what he says. Now look at the next verse. Verse 17. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, for we are not like many, in other words, they, like that group, right? Peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. They was that group when he says, for we are not like many, they, that's them. 
they were the insincere ones. They were making merchandise of the gospel. They were hucksters. They were con men. They were in it for the money. A whole lot of people in the ministry only for the money. That's the only reason why they're in the ministry. They were willing to twist or to shape their message deceitfully in order to maximize their profits. If it meant preying on people's fears, they would do that. If it meant trying to discredit an apostle like Paul, they would do that too. If it simply meant tickling people's ears by giving them whatever message they demanded, here were some ready teachers for that. They were the first century equivalent of today's market-driven philosophies of church leadership and ministry that is so prevalent all over the world. Paul answered the rhetorical question in verse 16. Who is sufficient for these things? Now, how does he begin to... Now, he's not done. Paul is not done responding. Paul is prolific in his responses. He is absolutely prolific. Why? Because he has to explain everything. Everything You know, people ask me simple questions in their mind when they think it's a simple question. And I go, well, I can answer that. The problem is you're not, not going to understand the answer. And Paul, this is what Paul is doing here. He hasn't stopped. Look at this. I want you to see this with me. And, and I want you to see how this flows. Because now Paul... We've been working our way through 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I don't know if you noticed that. We've been going verse by verse by verse. We're working our way through this. Now, now notice now he now begins to unpack right, the death nail. All right? Right on the coffin. Watch this. Paul answered the rhetorical question. Who is adequate, right, for these things? Because that was the charge. The charge was that he was not adequate. Right? That's what charges, right? So look at, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to notice verses um, 1 through 5. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Woo! Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on the tablets of stone but on the tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. And finally, verse 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. You see that? He said, in essence, when you read these verses, okay, that the only person who's really adequate to lead is the one whom God has made a leader. Self-made leaders are utterly incompetent. By contrast, Paul said this. At the end of verse 5, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. That statement is key to this brief passage and a summary of Paul's self-defense. Look, four things. Paul was about, he was being attacked at four fronts, okay? And at least a minimum four, okay? Uh, he, he was being attacked left and right, up and down, in and out, I mean forward and backwards. But the four main areas that they used to try to attack him were palpable, okay? They were readable. They were visible. And this is what they were trying to do. 
because they can draw the attention. So this is what they're trying to do. Paul was being attacked on several fronts. Here's the four areas. His character, his influence, his calling, and his humility. You are going to be attacked in your character, in your influence, in your calling, and in your humility. That's going to happen. The false apostles who had successfully infiltrated the Corinthian church had relentlessly assaulted him by striking repeatedly at each of those particular targets. Which targets? His character, his influence, his calling, and his humility. Those are the four areas that Paul was being attacked under. And notice how skillfully Paul begins to reply to them. Paul was no slouch when it came to responding. Remember, he just, I mean, he was an artisan. Paul painted this picture, right, of this triumphal parade. When he got attacked about his ability to lead. And, And when he painted that picture, they understood immediately what it was that he was saying about the false apostles. That aroma from death to death and from life to life, he painted this picture so clear because he now likened the aroma to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we unpack this verse by verse why we follow it in that order, because you're able to see with the clearer details of how Paul is responding. So Paul, number one, his character now being attacked, he's a somewhat on the horns of a dilemma, somewhat, as he has defended himself, because now he's got to make a decision. How do I do this? Why do I do this? Do I need to do this? Listen to me. Sometimes you have to defend yourself not for yourself, but because your church is about to be attacked by false teachers, false apostles, false prophets. They're coming in like wolves, and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to attack the qualifications of your leader. You better know his character. You better know his influence. You better know his calling. Okay? You better know those things, okay? And you better know his humility. If you don't know him, okay, then they're going to come and sway you because these guys are very good at what they do. 